Welcome to Super Fun Stuff and part two of creating our cat mech named Catnip. In part one, we went over some basic sculpting techniques. In this video, we'll paint them. We go into laying our base colors, oil washes, oil filtering, and most fun part, graffiti. So let's go into it. For this, we're first going to use our trusty airbrush to lay down our primer and base colors. However, I'm going to try a new airbrush out. This airbrush is a fully portable electric battery operated air compressor. It's actually pretty tiny, outputs around 6 to 8 psi, and lasts about an hour. This goes for around $50 on Amazon, and comes with the airbrush as well. Now, the quality of this thing is a little debatable. The airbrush itself is pretty cheap, but I mostly bought it for the compressor part. But if you're on a budget, and strictly only going to use this for miniatures, this may be a good product for you. So first I lay my primer on. That's pretty easy. Then I lay some dark blue shadowing. This is a way we can simulate some dark shadow regions and break away from the flat paint. I use blue because I think it gives a nice color to the shadows versus just a plain black or just a darker color. I'm going to keep this guy pretty light, almost like a concrete gray type look. I apply an ash gray as the primary base color, and I lay it all over. I make the paint pretty thin so when it gets sprayed on, it kind of overlaps and blends with the blue shadowing versus just covering up. And to finish the airbrushing, I use a Gorgon Hide color. This is like a lighter gray, and I splash a few highlights here and there. For this, I did a tad different process, doing small little circles on the highlight areas. I saw this in some of the airplane modeling videos, and it looked kind of cool for a nice metal look. So here is the final airbrushing product. You can see how the blues come out, and it gives kind of a false shadow type look. The highlights are subtle, and they're meant to be, and we're going to be completely changing the color anyways when we do the oils. Washes play a big part in miniature painting as they can be used in a variety of ways. I decided that I wanted to make this guy look completely dirty, nasty, and old. A regular acrylic wash would do okay, but it settles weird in some places sometimes and it doesn't work very long. So this is why we're going to use an oil wash, also called a gunk wash. I was a little scared at first with oil washes, but now I won't ever go back. It's actually pretty simple to do. I'm using an Abletung oil paint, specifically the sepia color. There are a few other colors you can use too, but this is what I had, so I'm going to use it. Also, you'll need thinner, as water doesn't thin oil paints the same way as acrylics. Plus, you want to clean your brushes after too, so you need a thinner. Oil is a unique animal when it comes to painting. A lot of old school miniatures actually use oils. Benefits of oils include being able to work with a long time, altering the paint using thinners or spirits, and they blend seamlessly. The downfall of oil paints is that they take a long time to dry. While acrylics dry basically in seconds to minutes, oils dry in hours to days. So it kind of comes down to versatility versus time. An oil wash is simple. You take your oil paint and mix it with thinner. You want to get this pretty thin, almost like a thin paint. Then you just slap it all over your piece. You brush it on, or you can use an airbrush. It kind of depends what you want to do. You want to put this on fairly heavy and ensure that you get all the little nooks and crannies. After you have it all over, you need to wait a few minutes. This just helps the oil sit a little bit and won't come off as easy. Then we simply just wipe it off. For the heavier stuff, I use a paper towel with some thinner, but for the more detailed stuff, a good way is just using an old brush with some thinner. When you put thinner on the oil wash, it removes it. So be careful not to remove any of the details that you don't want to come off. But if worse comes to worse, and if you make a mistake, you can just add more of the wash on and wipe it off. Because of the work time, you can make mistakes and just try again. With my brush, I like to do a dabbing motion, and this gives kind of a nice texture. Also, it helps not to remove too much of the flat surface. Gunk washes are pretty cool. Just remember the more wash that you add, the more you have to wipe off, and you have to take your time removing the wash. I actually take a few passes wiping off the wash, removing little by little to make sure I get the right amount. Now let's go into some of the chipping highlights I like to do. Around the metal it gets scuffed and damaged and it ruins kind of the paint job. So I take some of my Gorgon hide and with a fairly fine brush I add little chips around the edges. I make small marks every time and group them in pretty random patterns. If you watch a few other videos you can also use a little sponge, but I find that it produces chips that I don't like and it puts in the wrong places. I like to decide where I put the details so I do them by hand, but it definitely takes a lot longer. There's also chipping fluid and the hairspray method, which also works okay too. When you paint chips and scuffs by hand, it does kind of take forever. You just have to be patient and take your time. I probably spent most of a day just adding these little guys all over. With that done, now it's time for the dot filtering effect. 
This is how we're going to add more colors and blend them in to break up the monotony of the white and gray color. Using my oil paints, I use a blue color and an ochre. Here we go around and add little small dots of paint. I like to clump them up and apply them in the darker recess areas. You can also just apply them all over if you want to. If you have a flat surface, it looks good. For this model, I go in the areas where I think there'll be a little more rust or algae or a little more metal distress of some kind. What's cool with oils is that since they dry so slow, you can put all your dots on your model ahead of time. Then you can just simply take a little thinner with your brush and blend them in. If you add too much thinner, you'll remove the paint, so you need to try to find that balance. So here's what it looks like so far. You can definitely see all the extra colors and how it makes it more interesting and fun. We can see the metal textures pop out, the weld lines, and just how the filtering changes the model. If you see some areas you don't like or you want to change, you can fairly easily change them and just using more thinner or more paint. Now with this model, I plan to have a lot of rust. I first take some of my burnt sienna oil paint and add a thinned down version around the rust areas. I did the bullet holes like they were there a long time, some scratches, and some other areas around the edges of the chipping. Again, if you mess up, thinner just takes it away and you can just start over. Now you can just stick with oil paints if you want like a light rust, but this guy's going to be like really rusty in certain spots. I take my pigments, add a little water, and then clump the rust on certain areas. I do various shades of brown and reddish rust and just dab it on. Now it's time to have some fun. It's graffiti time. Graffiti comes in all shapes and sizes. One type you may see is like a bubble lettering, another might be a swirly, almost unreadable lettering, etc, etc. So for this it would be good to go online and just do some quick google searching of different types of graffiti. Graffiti is also layered a lot. People tag and paint stuff over each other all the time. This is important because it shows more of the depth of the graffiti itself. I first take a piece of paper and just draw some graffiti out that I think would look good. This is one I actually painted just to see the color scheme. But you can see the different lettering and sizes that make up the graffiti. Also, I plan where I want to put it before I paint it. For this, I plan to put it right on the body hull door. Before I start painting, I take a soft pencil and lightly draw it on the model. Then using a fine tip brush, I paint it on. For this first one, the meow, I painted the colors first and then I outline it with black. Then on the top of that, I take a white and paint the word fluffy tag right overlapping the meow. Black outlining helps get the point across with some of the thicker letters, but you can also use different kind of colors or you can just use it for like shadowing. Graffiti can be anything you really want, using any colors as well. This is why online references are a huge thing to utilize for this. Let's take another example. I traced this awesome Believe script that I found online. I traced it on the mini using my pencil and then painted lettering using a nice blue. I think it turned out great. But since graffiti comes in all different shapes and sizes, it's always good to sketch them out before you start painting them, just in case they don't look right. I look at my sheet while I was painting him too. On this sheet, I try all different kinds of looks. Graffiti doesn't have to be just text either. You can also paint pictures and other stuff. Now with a mini this size, you have to keep it kind of small. You want to paint the graffiti proportional to the person that would be painting it. So for instance, this is a mech, so it's a little bit larger, and the guy would be fairly tiny, so he can only paint so much with one can. You can see that my mini has all different types that I've tried. I have large words, thin words, some pictures, and a good amount of overlapping. The only issue with painting graffiti is that to get the real effect, you kind of have to paint a lot of it. It takes a lot of time, a thin brush, a steady hand, and a lot of creativity. Now a few things I left out of this video is just some of the smaller details. You can just do this whenever you want, and there wasn't anything really special about doing it that you haven't seen before. So now I just slap this guy on the base, and voila, he's done. I also made some arms for him. I made them red like they've been replaced as the original ones were destroyed or something. It kind of gives a nice little contrast. So the backstory for this mech is that he was ditched a long time ago, and he was left outside for years, maybe under like an overpass or something like that. Well, it sat for a long time, it rusted, and plus kids and random people started to tag it. Then someone found it and decided to bring it into service and battle it in the games. I haven't really released the lore for this game yet, but this will make sense later. While I'm talking about the game that I was making, let me show you some more stuff about it. The game uses these mechs, which I call Animus Engines, as the primary fighters. All the parts are magnetized, with the head, body, legs, and arms separate. So, if you damage a part, you remove it from the battle. 
Every arm is its own weapon, so you swap these weapons throughout the game. Also, each arm can be put on both the left or the right arm. They have magnets on each side that have the polarities that match the body. So swapping these weapons doesn't really sound like anything new or interesting that we haven't seen before, but what if I told you that these weapons were chosen for you completely random? So one minute you could have the best strongest weapon, in another, the weakest worthless weapon. This is a big mechanic in this game I'm making, a lot of random draw of tokens and a lot of random dice outcomes. Also, what happens if your legs are destroyed? Well, I engineered the base to supplement both a legged and unlegged model. So if the legs are destroyed, you would remove the legs and use a smaller base inside the normal base. If you repair the legs, then you add the larger base on top of the smaller base, and then put the body back together. It's two base in one kind of thing. Also, here's another Animus engine that I made. He's a dog type mech that I call Wags. Each mech has different stats and strengths. Catnip is more of a default all rounder type mech, while Wags is more of a defense type mech. So each part has stats that make them unique. A player can make any type of mech they want, so it's fully customizable. Without going into much detail about the game, here's everything I've made in prototype so far. I've modeled everything from scratch and printed it to make sure it works correctly. So, our catnip is done, and I think he turned out great. Look at the graffiti we made, I think it looks awesome. I hope you enjoyed the video, learned some new techniques, and learned more about my game I'm making. I'm putting a lot of effort to make this game very fun and enjoyable. I still have more work to do on it, ironing out some of the details, and creating more weapons and equipment. I have so much planned, I just can't find enough time to make it all, but I'm super excited about it. Well, thank you for watching, and thank you to all my patrons and supporters. Let me know what you think about this video and the game I'm making. I'd love to hear your feedback. Cheers!